So a lot of you enjoyed the Shocking Truths video where I highlighted black historical events of people here in the Augusta, Georgia area. Some of you even requested that I share more history about Augusta as it relates to African-Americans. So I feel the best way to do that and the best way to close out on Black History Month is to feature one of Augusta's very own, the Godfather of Soul, James Brown. So in today's video, I'll not only talk to you about James Brown, but I'm going to do better than that. I'm gonna take you along with us on the James Brown Family Historical Tour right here in Augusta. We're gonna see places in Augusta where James Brown used to hang out, his old stumping ground, people that he used to talk to, people that he knew. We're gonna hear firsthand stories about James Brown as it relates to living in the Augusta, Georgia area. All of that is coming up just for you right after this. Hey everybody, if this is your first time to the channel and you wanna learn what it's like to live, work, play, and invest in the Augusta, Georgia area and the surrounding areas, then you're definitely in the right place. Subscribe to the channel, tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to learn about what it's like to live in the Augusta, Georgia area. I'm Delrisa Rollerson, Augusta Certified Relocation Specialist and welcome to the original Living in Augusta, Georgia channel. Today, not only will I tell you what it's like to live in Augusta, but I'm gonna take you on a tour so you can see some of what it's like to be James Brown and live in the Augusta, Georgia area. But before we get started on the tour, let's jump into a little history. So James Brown was born on May 3rd, 1933 in Barnwell, South Carolina. His mom, Susie, was 16 years old and his father, Joseph Gardner Brown, was 21. So in his autobiography, James Brown said that his father was mixed. He was African-American and Native American descent. And his mother was mixed as well. She was African-American and Asian descent. So James Brown, his family, they actually in South Carolina, they lived in poverty. So James Brown had very humble beginnings. They moved here to Augusta, Georgia when he was about four or five. And so I'm gonna show you the house that James Brown was raised in. So he initially moved with one of his aunts and then they ended up moving with another aunt, Aunt Honey, which she had a house over on Twig Street. So I'm gonna show you that. And eventually his mother ended up leaving the family because of abuse. It was an abusive marriage and she moved to New York. So she left James Brown with his aunt with Aunt Honey. And this is really where there was a lot of night entertainment that was provided for the troops in Camp Gordon. So for, it was, it's now Fort Eisenhower, it was named Fort Gordon and then it was Camp Gordon before, but it was, that's where she basically provided entertainment for the troops. And so James Brown, he also brought money into the family because what he would do was he would dance and he would sing for the troops as they would come in town. And he would also go on Broad Street and he would also bring groceries in. He would assist people with their groceries and he would do just different things around town for money. So we're starting the whole day and the whole video today at the Augusta Museum of History, which is right behind me. So let's jump right in. The James Brown Historical Family Tour Bus runs once a week on Saturdays from the Augusta Museum of History here in Augusta. Our tour guide is Kiki and she's going to give us information on history of James Brown growing up and also living in Augusta. So we're going to start the tour going down James Brown Boulevard. We've got to start the tour going down James Brown Boulevard and we're going to go to Twig Street, which is the street where James Brown grew up. So this is actually where James Brown grew up. It's now a motorcycle club, but when he moved from South Carolina to Augusta, this is exactly where he was raised with his Aunt Honey. So it's 944 Twig Street here in Augusta. Now his Aunt Honey was on his dad's side of the family. And this is where the troops from Camp Gordon would come and they would get night entertainment basically provided for them. So when you see the movie, Pretty Girls, Pretty Girls, Whiskey, Pretty Girls, this is exactly where that happened. It actually happened on this street. And this is actually the street where Moving On was recorded as well. So now we're gonna go right around the corner in the same community and we're approaching James Brown's church. This is Trinity CME Church. This is where James Brown, when he was a little boy, he would sweep the floor, the floors here and he would take breaks to play the piano. This is where actually one of his friends taught him to play the piano and the church would let him practice 
on the piano. So like so many other singers, James Brown grew up on gospel music. Now, this church has a very interesting story because the church was previously located right across the street. So as you can see right here, this is where the church was until just a few years ago. But it was literally lifted and moved to be placed where it is now. And it's placed now as a historical landmark. So we're still in James Brown's neighborhood, and right now I'm standing in front of the Silas Floyd School, which was James Brown's childhood school. This school is literally about a 10 to 15 minute walk from James Brown's home. So remember I mentioned James Brown came from humble beginnings and he was raised in a low income household with his aunt honey literally right around the corner. Well, they couldn't afford the type of clothes that other children had and really the type of clothes that the school thought he should be wearing. So while in the seventh grade, James Brown was kicked out of this school and he was forced to drop out for wearing insufficient clothing. Now, something like this would have been a huge deterrent for positive future growth for most children. But for James Brown, this really put a spark in him for the importance of education. So as he grew up, he focused on preserving the need for education among youth, which was influenced by his really his troubled childhood and by being forced to drop out of school. This also influenced his work and he released the pro-education song don't be a dropout. So royalties for that song, they were donated to dropout prevention charity programs. And really as a result of that, he met President Lyndon B. Johnson. He had an opportunity to meet him and pre the president cited James Brown for being a positive role model to the youth. So for the rest of his life, James Brown made public speeches all over the world in schools and, and he always advocated the importance of education in school. And despite being kicked out of school while in his career, he would regularly come right back here to the Silas Floyd School where he would bring children candy and encourage them to stay in school, which as you can imagine, I'm, that could that's I'm sure that was a huge inspiration to a lot of children to be able to see someone in their neighborhood become successful and beat the odds. So although he was kicked out of school, which is right here, it's been said that one of his favorite teachers continued to teach him outside of school as he became more popular and had a need for education and as he traveled all throughout the world. So back in the day, this building was known as the city's Civic Center, but it's been renamed to the James Brown Arena. And there have been so many different types of celebrities, concerts, comedy shows, dirt bike shows, wrestling shows have all been held right here at the James Brown Arena. All of the seats here are good seats. In fact, the James Brown Arena is where one of James Brown's memorial services were held. There were about 8,500 people attending, including fans, celebrities, public figures, MC Rapper, MC Hammer was in town, Michael Jackson, Jesse Jackson, Reverend L. Sharpton. So let me know in the comments, if you have been to the James Brown Arena, who did you see? Let me know when you came in town. I'll be curious to know about that. In certain, you know, areas, the music and public education is not pushed. So uh, in 2011, five years after his, Mr. Brown's passing, his daughter Deanna Brown started the James Brown Academy of Music Pupils. And they say, they, they say James Brown play instruments, they do his music, they do, they, they do all uh, genres, and they're really, really good. And they used to have their concert here. They moved the, um, back to the museum as a research. It's called the Jam Cert. Really, really good. They have a theme each year, and it's really, really good. But they started here. They would also perform at the um, toy giveaway. So you got James Brown's family, you got Jamp Band performing, and then you've got the family doing the will of Mr. Brown, giving out toys right about a week before Christmas. And this, this, this past year was the biggest one. I think she serviced, this showed me 600 kids that they served that day. So we were able to, you know, give back and everything. So the plaque that we're looking at here is for the renaming of the building to the James Brown Arena. This was actually done in August of 2006. So James Brown had the opportunity to see this and he knew about this because he passed in December of that same year. And then the list of names that you see here, these are the list of donors. This whole establishment is getting ready to be destroyed. It's gonna to be torn down rebuilt and it's a 250 million dollar project and they will be finished in 2026 so the james brown arena is getting ready to go under a major overhaul and it's going to be something spectacular coming to the augusta georgia area
So next we'll take a look at some more of the tributes honoring James Brown. So we are downtown Augusta now and here you're seeing a life-size bronze statue of James Brown that was actually unveiled when he was alive. He had the opportunity to see this and this is in the heart of downtown Augusta. And next we're going to go and we're going to take a look at a mural that's on a building downtown Augusta and we're going to have to go ahead and let Kiki explain to us details on that. Let's look at some of the uh, solid parts of the mural to look and see some of those uh, song titles. You got Get on the Good Foot in Orange and Blue. Oh, okay. Please, 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 please. Okay. In, um, in Orange and Red, Tribe's at the very top. You got Make It Funky over here on the left in Purple and uh, Teal. He was a, uh, all right, last is now. He's an inaugural Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee. So when they first opened the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it started around all those um all those uh classic rock and roll buddy holly elvis presley little Rich, they, they all came in the same class with mr brown in 1986. he is a double r and um hall of fame inductee once as a solo writer and then as a performer got the uh early mr brown when he first had his comb i like this i like his hair the detail of his hair yeah. they got the um the stained glass windows remember he started out Second like gospel mm -hmm. with, with, with Bobby Bird. So you got that uh, gospel quartet. You got um, Godfather Soul, Hard Working Man and Show Business, all of his monikers. You've got this um, picture here on the left, a little bit later on in life. But let's come on right to the right. You got the first iteration, the please, 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 when he's first begging. He's got the um, birth and death dates around the microphone base. Uh, Mr. Dynamite. And you and then you've got right here, you got Mr. Brown with the cape. Now, let me tell you something. Get, get, get to this, Mr. Lewis. Okay, so Mr. Brown has on a belt, okay? Yeah. James Brown did not wear a belt. That's an artist kind of thing. Yeah, really. In the 70s, come on now, in the 70s, belts were Elvis's thing. Right. Elvis wore those on his jumpsuits. Right. And Elvis had very good friends. So you've got that, he kind of put that out like, hey, you like those jumpsuits on Mr. Brown's? This stuff was table-made, but the artist put that in. He's got his cake, you've got his hair um, detailing through here. So all of these things um, kind of uh, lend itself to our part of our culture. Too. And then, there's a, if y'all want to check, let's go down. Let's look at this up. hand. There's a hand-painted um, concert ticket from the 69 show. 68. So I'm standing right now in front of a building that was owned by James Brown. So remember I mentioned earlier that James Brown was uh, kicked out of school in seventh grade by the Board of Education basically because of his lack of clothes. But he ended up purchasing this building that's right here behind me. He purchased this building, he had this building, and the people who purchased the building from him was the Department of Education. So, so interesting in this story that I found it to be that the Department of Education kicked him out of school because of his lack of clothes, but then they ended up purchasing real estate from him years later when he was an adult. James Brown was actually involved in a lot of different business ventures throughout his life. Some of the types of businesses that he had was he had a music label and production company. He founded his very own music label and it was called People Records. And this actually allowed him to have greater creative control over his music and also to promote other artists that were all over. So he also established a production company called Fair Deal to manage his recordings and productions. In addition to that, James Brown had various nights clubs he owned several nightclubs during his career including the popular james brown house of bees in augusta georgia and it's become a hub for the live music and entertainment in addition to that he had a publishing company bellevue publishing which managed the rights to his own songs and compositions 
In addition to that, he also had retail. So additionally, he ventured into the retail business, including his own record, record store in Harlem and New York. In addition to that, also invested in real estate properties, including purchasing and developing land in Augusta, Georgia. And in addition to that, he also had radio stations. He owned radio stations and operated radio stations such as WRDW in Augusta, which helped him expand his influence in media industry. So I'm standing right in front of the airport that is the airport that James Brown used to have his plane in. And James Brown, what I just learned on the tour was that James Brown is the first African-American man to have owned a plane and a jet. And this is exactly where he used to come. Years ago, he would have his plane here in Augusta, Georgia. So I'm here right now in the Imperial Theater right here in Augusta, Georgia with the technical director that's over the Imperial Theater. And he was actually the technical director, well, one of the technical directors when James Brown was renting this facility. So I just wanted to introduce you. Thank you so much, Tim, for coming on and just sharing information. So tell me, um, tell me how you interacted with James Brown and what you saw with him. I interacted more with his band members and his management than I did with Mr. Brown himself. Um, he, uh, the, he would rent the theater for about a week and uh, the band would come in and set up and they would do um, a rehearsal, uh, you know, multiple days of rehearsals before mm -hmm. they would go out on one tour leg or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of that rehearsal period, Mr. Brown himself would join in mm -hmm. and they would spend a day or two here doing their rehearsals together. Wow. wow. So did you have an opportunity to really see them rehearse? Uh, I saw the band more than I saw Mr. Brown. Okay. Uh, like I said, he came in towards the end. Okay. But. It was an interesting experience. Because I, in doing my research, I discovered that he was, of course, very meticulous. Yes. Very detailed. Very everything. He was very efficient when it came to his, of course, his music and his, his career. And what I read was that when members would come in late, and if they didn't have their shoes shined, if they weren't dressed properly, he fined them. Yes. Did you happen to see any of that? I did not see any of that, but I've heard the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I was really, really surprised. I'm like, we need that We need that ethical mindset nowadays yeah. with a lot of people in entertainment and this overall in corporate America, right? I agree. So then, so now one of the things that was also really interesting with the theater here is that Back in the day, when he was renting this facility, was African Americans even allowed to come and watch? Well, yeah. The, when when he was renting this facility, it was in the the nineties. Okay, so, okay. You know, for sure. Okay, uh, okay. At that point, but this theater is over a hundred years old. Right. And so um, uh, it was built in the time of or before or around segregation, you know, during segregation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, as time went on. Um, that started to go away. Right. And uh, this theater was initially built and uh, it was one of the only theaters in downtown Augusta that mm -hmm. actually allowed African Americans really? in the building. And uh, they had a certain way that they had to be here. Yes. Uh, they could not intermingle with the, the rest of the, the facility. So there is actually on the, uh, the right side, if you're looking at it from the front of the building, mm -hmm. on the right side, there's a door that goes mm -hmm. to a stairwell. Okay. And that stairwell, halfway up, there is a, um, a door. And in that door is a, um, a ticket booth, okay. the remnants of a ticket booth. Mm. And uh, that is where African-Americans would purchase their tickets, and then they would only be allowed to sit at the very top of the theater. Wow. Okay, so I was just here in your theater on Friday for Dreamgirls. And as an African-American, of course, I came through the front entrance with Caucasians, Asians, and all type of ethnic persuasions and that that opportunity would not have been given to me had it been 40, 50, well, maybe 60 years ago or so. It's, it's changed a lot. So though. it has changed a lot. And for you to see just some of the things that you've seen, even um, even though you weren't, of course, alive at some of that time, but, <laughs> but for you to even see how things have changed here and progressed over time. So to imagine, like, so explain to me where where I would have been allowed to sit 
during that dispensation of time. Okay. Um, so right now we're on the main level. Yeah, we're on the main level. We're on what's called the orchestra level. Okay. And um, then the what's right above us is called the mezzanine level. Okay. And then there's a first balcony and a second balcony. A se second. And that second balcony uh, is where the African Americans would have sat at that time frame. So can you really see in the second balcony? You can. It's it's high up, you know. So it's it's not a bad view mm -hmm. uh, maybe depending on your show and how your your trims for your borders and all are you might not be able to see upstage is, is what we call the the most farthest away part of the stage from the front mm -hmm. so you might not have seen upstage as um, as well up there wow wow so for james brown to rent this entire establishment just really for rehearsal i mean that was a big accomplishment even in that day in the 90s to even be able to do that when we weren't even allowed to come on this level that I'm sitting in right now. In, in the older days. In the older days, in the older days. And we weren't allowed to even interact with other individuals that were here. Yeah, yeah. And I, honestly, even for me, I haven't seen that before because I've been blessed to be able to come through the front door. But anything else you could think of about James Brown? Um, he, like you said, he was very meticulous um, in, in his rehearsal process and I always enjoyed when he was, was here and I had the opportunity to see him work. I think that he is one of Augusta's treasures that yes. maybe we don't look on as, as kindly and, and as we, we should. Yeah, I was, he has done so much. He did so much. I mean, he had so many businesses. It was amazing. And for him to only have had a seventh grade education, um, it was just amazing. The, and actually, I just discovered he was the very first African American to own a jet. He owned a jet and he also owned an airplane. Which, after I thought about it, I said he probably did that because he probably had a lot of resistance with, you know, going back and forth internationally, being an African American in that time period. I don't know, but it could have been he just had the money and he needed it, you know, to get back and forth. It was like a car to him, maybe. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, thank Great. you so much. I appreciate well, it. So now we've seen a little bit of where James Brown has grown up and some of the things that he participated in. So now I have the opportunity. I'm here with someone who knew James Brown personally. I'm here with Terry. Terry, and Terry is actually a friend of mine. So thank you so much, Terry, for coming on the video and sharing your story and just everything well, that you're gonna share with us today. I guess it is my story. And uh, you know, I just think this is really cool what you're doing, kind of. Thank you. Sometimes we take for granted um, what's going on right in front of us. And, and to share history and information about Mr. Brown uh, seems kind of simple and easy because you've lived it, but there's right. a lot of people out there that are very curious. And so I'm honored to be here to speak to you today about um, Mr. Mr. Brown. Yeah, you know, well, thank you. I guess my, my story starts in Athens, Georgia. In 1974, um, my dad was a basketball coach with with University of Georgia, a fundraiser. Um, I was very good friends with uh, this fellow, Derek Dooley. You guys, I don't know if you'll, okay. the name makes sense to you, but his father was the football coach for Georgia, Vince Dooley. And, and well, I'm not a football fan. So. That's fine, that's fine. There are a lot of people out there at all. But you guys probably know, I don't know. So in 1974, <laughs> I was six, and, and Barbara, Dooley was Vince's wife and okay. she's very good friends with my mother and she picked Derek and I up and we went to the homecoming parade. And, okay. And here comes this fella in a one-piece zip-up suit with flames going down the side and Derek and I looked at each other and said, and I think Derek said, Mama, who is that? <laughs> and he looked at us and she said, that boys, that's James Brown. <laughs> you know, and, and that was the first time that I saw him. Eventually, um, I moved to Augusta, Georgia in okay. 1982. Okay. And finished up high school here. And um, being from Athens, you know, um, uh, there wasn't, in my opinion, much musical talent here. And the one, okay. one show that was in town was The Godfather of Soul. He was the master of funk. Okay. He was the man. And gosh, uh, in 1988, I was working at this great little jazz uh, French cafe called the Cafe du Tour. Okay. It was on Central Avenue in Augusta, Georgia. 
and we would have jazz nights on Sunday nights, and um, the closing time was 12 o'clock. Well, uh, Mr. Brown would come in sometimes at 9 or 10 and bring his entourage with him and, <laughs> and have dinner, and um, I was lucky enough to be a waiter there, and there was a particular uh, server, his name is Pierre Sutton. I, I would love to find him, Pierre, if you're out there, because I, I think he might be in Chicago somewhere. Please oh, yeah. contact us. So if anyone knows Pierre, Pierre, Pierre Sutton. Sutton. So if anyone knows Pierre Sutton, um, send me an email. You can send me an email, you can send me a text, or you can give me a call so I can connect them with Terry Brogan here in Augusta, Georgia. Mr. Brown would always request Pierre because Pierre was refined, uh, knew his jazz quite well, his wine, but he had a um, particular habit that was great. He did not write anything down. It was a party of 10 or 20. He remembered everything that you had, your drink, your salad dressing, if you wanted bread or not, and he was a unique individual. He was gifted. And so he was very gifted, and I was blessed to know him, but Pierre would let me wait the party with him, and so that is kind of how I originally met Mr. Brown, really, okay. as an older person, and, and he would come in on Sundays, and, and he would tell Mr. Duto, hey, I, I think I want to get up and play the piano. And so mm -hmm. Don would say, hey, we're, we're closing at 12 o'clock, and if you want to leave, you need to pay your tab up now because we have a special guest star that wants to sit down and play the piano. He would never say his name, he but everybody <laughs> in the house knew it. Okay. And that is uh, when my first time of having an intimate evening okay. with Mr. Brown playing the piano. Um, to my knowledge, he, he did not write or he did not understand reading music. It was all by ear. Right. He could play several instruments that I had no idea that he could play, but wow. um, those evenings were special. Um, so eventually, I, I, I you know, moved on and, and opened my own place with two very good, you know, my, my best friend and and his little brother, um, mm -hmm. and that was the Soul Bar in okay. Augusta, Georgia in 1994. This is, you know, five or six years later, one special evening, um, got a call from his assistant that Mr. Brown and his entourage would be coming into the bar, please have some Pierre. We were a, a, a hole in the wall bar and uh, we rushed down to the liquor store and Got some Pierre Cardian, I believe. Okay, so there you go. Bottles. Um, <laughs> and uh, to, to, to my um, surprise, um, soon thereafter, Mr. Brown arrived with a couple of limousines and probably about 20 people. And oh, wow. Came in, everybody was dressed to the nines. Wow. And, you know, he popped the champagne and he served everybody. And the only person that he didn't really serve that night was himself. Sure. And uh, you know, you hear stories about Mr. Brown and uh, Mr. Brown did not drink that much. And in, in, in my recollection, he occasionally might have had a Coors Light, but okay. he was not a big yeah. drinker. Wow, wow. Um, so I was uh, chosen to play pool with him that night. And um, I racked up the balls and had a disposable camera because we did not have iPhones and took a picture of him. But as I as I racked the balls up and, and backed away, I, I don't I don't think it was Danny Ray, who was uh, Mr. Brown's cape man, who we'll talk about in a minute, but somebody, just ever so slightly, came up behind my ear and says, You know the Godfather never loses pool. Well yes sir. <laughs> no. So in this picture that you showed me, which is the picture that we have on the screen now, was he sizing up the table then? No, no, it was all about show. It was okay. all about my father. It was all about him coming into this, um, this um, unique little uh, building that was um, basically uh, uh, for him. Okay, okay. And soon thereafter, he, you know, or the band members would go on European tours or whatever. Right. And they would come back from posters from China, from, wow. you know, Tokyo, right. from all over the world. And if you go in the Soul Bar today, um, now it's, I think it's been open 27 years. I, Which you no longer own it now. No, no. I, okay, I sold so out probably it. in uh, night, uh, um, um, 2017. 
Okay, but the Soul Bar is still here in the Yes, Alaska. yes, yes, it, it is. It's still, uh, I believe, owned by, by Coco Cuthbert Rubio. Okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I might be wrong though. Um, so, um, so yes, I was 27 at the time and it was absolutely wonderful. And, and then there, I hope, there might be another picture or two that you show, but there's one where, um, where Mr. Brown is hugging me and he's telling me, you know, you've got responsibility to the soul and you need to be humble and you need to teach these kids the right way to, you know, go about their business. And, and that really, I hear it more now then, but my head was really big after I, you know, he had pulled me to the side and, um, you know, um, uh, taken me under his wing. And right. um, it was it was a wonderful experience. Now I will say this: um, um, I did get to be good friends also with Mr. Danny Ray, okay. who, who was okay. Mr. Brown's cake man. Now um, there were several times that um, we were um, invited to come see um, dress rehearsals before they went on tours, and so there were many times that you would be standing there. And eventually, I became really uh, good friends with Mr. Ray. He was always there. He was the cape man. He was iconic. And um, I know that this conversation is about Mr. Brown. That, but no, but I've got to sneak Mr. Ray in there. He's part of it because he's the cape man. He had the most unique experience. Um, probably several times after I had met him, I finally said, Mr. Ray, how did you get into this? Okay. And okay. he said, well, you know, actually I was working at a theater in New York and I asked him was it the Apollo and he said no it wasn't okay. the Apollo I, I don't know I don't know exactly the theater's name but he said golly I don't know exactly the year maybe in the 50s the late 50s okay okay he said um, the MC had gotten really drunk the night before I guess to the point where he was pretty hungover okay and Mr. Brown was playing that night he came in to do his dress rehearsal and the MC wasn't there okay and then Mr. Brown came back around the MC still wasn't there. Mr. Ray was there. He was a stagehand or to okay. do whatever. And Mr. Brown said, hey, what are you doing? And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready for the show. And he said, well, you're going to introduce me tonight. Wow. <laughs> and I said, well, how did that make you feel? And he said, on my stomach, he said, I about <laughs> yeah, myself. <laughs> and I was so nervous coming out. Uh -oh, coming out and he spun it off and um, you know that relationship lasted 46 years. Wow in the right place at the right time for that exactly opportunity. What you said. For that opportunity. Yes. So when you mentioned the rehearsals yes. do, you, do you have any experiences that you've seen him like in his rehearsal mode or anything? Well I gotta tell you um, a lot of people don't realize you know there's a lot of people on stage with Mr. Brown there's a lot of players mm -hmm. There's a lot of dancers. Mm -hmm. He'll bring singers on. He wants to perform with everybody, but he also is the master, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so, but but um, a lot of people don't understand that every step, every tap, every hit me is all choreographed down to the him. Really. And it's funny. The the Augusta is known as the masters, and mm -hmm. and really. I think the master, no disrespect to the Augusta National, but the right. master of Augusta is Mr. Brown. I mean, everything was under his control. Um, you know, the stories are legendary about him keeping his band straight and making sure that um, that their shoes were shined or that their bow tie was right. And wow. don't, don't show up here if your uniform is not right. Now, he's very meticulous and could have his back to you and tell exactly what was going on. And really? he, he um, you know, um, this, the stories are legendary, but yes, I, 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 I think, um, you know, there were, there were times that I would see him um, once or twice and um, he would find a player for missing a note in the beat with something he said that you wouldn't even realize really what he was doing because hey it sounded just great but if you were a player you knew you missed your beat and hey i just got you again okay and so got you again so um so um he he had everything in step Every, everything was choreographed and um he was very much in control of of, of the whole stage which is why he was who he was he was um now through time he would 
stop in occasionally mm -hmm. on a late Tuesday and play another pool game with me or mm -hmm. whatever. And that is really kind of when I really got to, got know, to know him. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's tough when everyone is around, but when you're like this mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you can talk to someone, one -on -one. you know, he would, for instance, you know, I had no idea about Future Shop. Okay. And he right. was telling me about his his alternative to Dick uh, Clark's American Bandstand, and it was called James Brown's Future Shock. And it was probably I don't know if it became came on before the Soul Train, but it was about the same time. Okay. You know? Okay. Um, he had his own magazine. Um, he had his own right. cookie company. A few things that maybe people don't know about him. And so you, you sent me the picture. I'm going to put that on the screen. The picture of the cookies. Yes. I didn't know. Yeah. He had, and even all of the research I've been doing to create this information, I did not know that he had a cookie company too. There's probably a whole lot that I'm forgetting, but I will say this. Um, he was left-handed. A lot of people that don't know this is, is that he was a, a lifelong Republican. He, he, um, he truly cared about keeping his own finances in his own pocketbook. Mm -hmm. um, now there was a, a lot of things that I found out. Um, and the most thing is that he was a community leader and um, before I moved to Augusta there were riots in the 1970s. I think mm -hmm. it was 1973. Um, there was a horrible event that took place and a young man was beaten and, and uh, people rose up in, in Augusta and they started to burn things down and okay. um, our governor at the time, I think his name was Maddox, called Mr. Brown and said, would you, would you please help now? You know, right. um, I, I was just a kid, but um, there were, I, I've seen great pictures of, of Mr. Brown in front of Castleberry's on top of a, a, an army tank. He's telling the crowd, hey, you guys need to behave. Well, mm -hmm. I guess what I didn't know is that he had already made this stop before with Martin Luther King, you know, um, and I think it's very well documented now. Um, Mr. Brown did a whole lot to, to hold people accountable mm -hmm. and to also uh, make sure that you acted right. Still, still going to this day uh, that a lot of people outside the local community don't know about is Mr. Mr. Brown, I think it's going on its 34th or 35th year now. Um, um, had, a, had a turkey giveaway. It still has a turkey giveaway. His, his uh, daughter Deanna and her husband Sean Thomas, uh, they're, they're very much uh, a part of what's going on there. And, um, you know, he always wanted to make sure that everybody had a meal for Thanksgiving. And he also wanted to make sure that at Christmas time that all, all, all kids had a toy. Right. And he still has a toy giveaway that, 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 um, that goes on to this day. To this day, it does, every year here. And, and, and so, you know, with that being said, you know, um, through time, um, there has been a music um, uh, academy that has been set up for Mr. Brown, and it's called the Jamp. Uh, Academy, James Brown Academy of Music Pupils, mm -hmm. and, and um, it wouldn't be just for me not to tell you all mm -hmm. to, to please go to James Brown Family, F E N, mm -hmm. fun, not, not fun, but F E N. Dot F is in Frank, D is in David, N is in Nancy. Dot org, and uh, look at their great web page and yes. learn about what what the Godfather of Soul and still his foundation does for the community of Augusta. Yes. We will end at the Augusta Historical Museum. Thank you so much, Carrie. I really, really appreciate you and all of the, the information that you have. You have a wealth of information that I know you're like, oh, I, don't, I didn't even say anything, but this is great information we wouldn't have otherwise had. I'm just thankful to um, have crossed paths. Um, he was always so humble and nice and approachable. Yeah. And, um, now, not, not all of his musicians will probably tell you that because he demanded perfection. Right, 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 right. There's a reason why he was. Right. And he was the master. He was. He was. Well, thanks again, Terry. Thank you. So now we'll see the section that they're featuring James Brown. Which is here. This is actually one of his outfits. So this is one of James Brown's outfits that was custom made in the 70s and in the 1970s.
So I really hope that you guys have gained a deeper appreciation for the man behind the music and for Augusta, Georgia. And I'd like to hear from you. Let me know in the comments if I shared any information that you didn't know about or if I reminded you of something that you already knew about, but I brought it back to your memory or if I missed sharing something about James Brown that you know about, feel free to put it in the comments so everybody else can see about it and I can read about it. Now, let's remember that James Brown's story is not just about entertainment. It's about resilience, determination, the power of music that crosses all barriers, all genres like he did. So as you can see, no matter what our obstacles are, are what our, no matter what our challenges are, if we embrace our God-given talents and determination, really the sky is the limit. So let me know in the comments if this, if this information has been inspiring to you, if it's made you think about things differently as far as goals, as far as just accomplishing things regardless of you live regardless of where you live and regardless of the cards you've been dealt so if you're planning to relocate to the augusta georgia area and you're ready to take the next step towards relocating and making your mark here in augusta i'll be honored to serve as your realtor and i'll be honored to connect you to my network to help you purchase your home here but i can't help you unless you give me a call so you got to give me a call the first step is reaching out give us a call send us a text shoot me an email better yet Click the link below, schedule a Zoom. I've got your back from relocating no matter the area. Don't you worry about it because we're here for you. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future insights about living in Augusta, Georgia, working, playing, and investing in Augusta. Once again, I'm Delrisa Rollison, Augusta's relocation specialist, and see you in the next video.